Hello and welcome to Engineering Physics 2PO4. 2PO4 is a course on mechanics. In this course, we do both statics and dynamics. It's a continuation of your first year physics course, and we're going to be working with some software as well. So we're going to be using Maple and Flex PDE in this course. You're going to be introduced to those mostly in the tutorial sections. There's no tutorial in the first week. Tutorials start on week two. And uh, we are going to mention these a little bit in the class, mostly, uh, mostly Maple through the lecture notes but they're quite important. So this delivery of the course is probably a little different than most that you've had before. Here's what you do. Before each class, you read the lecture notes so you can have this uh, document. You can find it on Avenue to Learn, ATL. And, uh, and you do the practice problems for that day, which are part of the lecture notes. So these are the ones that, that we work through. Just uh, work through them on your own so that you're familiar with the material. And then try to learn the material as well as you can because during each class, it's not, uh, it's not lectures, except for the first class. First class is an exception to this. During each class, we have 10 minutes for you to ask last minute questions to the instructor. So you can ask me some questions there if you like. And then 40 minutes on group assignments. You'll get together in groups of three that you're gonna pick on the first day of the class and work to answer practice problems that will be given out in the class by our TA. So while that's going on, individually, I'm going to call people out to do oral exams, which are going to try to assess the answer to the question, do you get it? We're going to have a lot of these oral exams throughout the course, and it's going to be the best, uh, your, your best out of five or something like that, depending on how many we're able to get through. I think we'll probably be able to get through about eight per person. It depends a little bit on registration and how often you're there for that. Now during each tutorial. So the tutorials are a little bit different. These are in the computer labs up in uh, Burke Science Building. There you work through the tutorial Word document which will be available on Avenue to Learn. You ask questions to your TA. So this is like a, a one on, um, well the TA is, is there to walk around and help you in kind of a one on one basis. As you have questions sometimes the TA will address the room and, uh, and try and deal with common confusion points. And you save your work to a USB key and learn Maple and Flex PDE as well as you can because that's what you're going to be doing during the tests and exams. So the tests, the both of them and the final exam are going to be in those computer labs. It's not going to be in the, uh, in the gym where most people are writing their exams. What you're going to be doing is sitting in the computer lab and you're going to get a test paper. The test paper has a lot of questions on it. The questions are generally going to be in two parts. First part of the question, you solve the problem just by uh, by kind of setting it up. You don't actually plug in numbers and come up with numerical answers. Second part of the question, you use Flex PDE or Maple as appropriate to come up with a numerical solution. Sometimes you'll need to answer specific questions about your code, like what was your equation section in Flex PDE, and that's a way to give you a little bit of part marks in case your first part of the problem, the setup, the physics part looks like it made sense, but then for some reason, the, the final answer doesn't look anything like what it's supposed to, so you just screwed up the code. I mean, your best bet is to just learn Flex PDE and Maple well enough throughout the course that you can solve the problems once you've set them up. The chapters for lectures one to eight are based on Physics for Scientists and Engineers by Surway. It's okay if you have a newer edition than this. These are just uh, notes that I made from the fourth edition. Your newer edition will have better pictures and maybe better explanations too. The three fundamental physical quantities are length, mass, and time, which are measured in meters, kilograms, and seconds. Dimensional analysis is a way to solve problems by leaving the dimensions in it in order to help you come up with, uh, with what the answer is. So physics is internally consistent. You should be able to leave the units or the dimensions inside your, uh, your numbers and your calculations and tell if you made a mistake somewhere. So if you find yourself adding five meters to three seconds, then you know something went wrong somewhere along the line. Here's an example you can try dimensional analysis for. If a car has a 20 inch diameter wheel oh, or uh, multiple 20 inch diameter wheels and it's traveling 80 kilometers an hour while the motor is at 2000 RPM. Find the ratio of engine to wheel rotations, the wheel to engine gear ratio. Okay, so the ratio should be dimensionless. We're gonna take the wheel turn ratio and divide it by the engine turn ratio, but we don't have the wheel turn ratio. We have the diameter of the wheels and the forward velocity of the car. We'll need to do a little bit of physics first. We know velocity is distance over time. The distance it travels in a wheel revolution is the wheel circumference. So per turn of a wheel, it travels pi d, and that means that the velocity can be related to pi d times the wheel RPM. So the gear ratio would be the engine RPM divided by wheel 
RPM and wheel RPM is V over wheel circumference from our calculation here and there it is there's our answer unfortunately it's in a bunch of different units so we need to do some work to clean that up the final ratio should be unitless we have our distance in the numerator and denominator in uh, inches and kilometers and we have inverse time in both as well so per minute and per hour Rewriting that by getting rid of the fractions in fractions, then replacing units with equivalent ones. So we know that an hour is 60 minutes to cancel the minutes. And we can substitute in that a kilometer is 1,000 meters and an inch is 2.54 centimeters, where a meter is 100 centimeters to come up with an engine to wheel gear ratio in this particular case of 2.39. And up next are SI prefixes. These are useful to know if you're gonna be working in engineering especially. So the prefixes tell you about the, are, are quick ways to write 10 to the power of something in, uh, in, in kind of a one letter case. So if you wanna say like a kilometer or a kilometer, then you can just write km and that means a thousand meters. Uh, a megameter would be a million meters. Gigameter would be 10 to the nine meters or a billion meters. And then so on. So tera, peta, exa, zeta, yada. And on the other side, we've got deca, centa, milla, micro, nano for fractions of meters. So a nanometer is 10 to the negative 9 meters. Picometer would be 10 to the negative 12 meters, meaning that there's a trillion picometers per meter. You should, at this stage, definitely memorize all of the ones in bold. So you need to know kilo, mega, giga, tera, and centa, milla, micro, nano, pico. You've got to have those memorized. The other ones, uh, you know, it's increasingly becoming important to have higher and higher ones memorized. So you'll see femtosecond pulse lasers mentioned. And if you've got Pico memorized, then you can kind of think, oh, well, femto is probably the next one. So it's 10 to the negative 15 seconds. You'll see DESA come up a little bit. So uh, we'll see something soon involving a decimeter. And deca and hecta are useful for area measurements. So when you're talking about land, but those ones, uh, I'd say that definitely the ones you need to have memorized are the ones in bold. If you memorize the other ones, then that's great. You can show off with some of those. Moving on, how many cubic millimeters are in a cubic meter? So when we get to questions like this, I'll usually give you a, a second to pause the video so that you can try and work it out yourself. That's the best way to do this. You could just look ahead and then see the answer, but then you don't get the chance to think about it and learn anything. So the best bet is for you to pause these questions, try and work on them yourself, see how far you can get. If you get stuck, then skip ahead. And as soon as you get inspiration for how to finish the question, try to pause and continue on on your own. Okay, here comes the solution. So we'll just use the factor label method here or dimensional analysis. We have one meter cubed. We'll multiply by one where one is a thousand millimeters per meter and the meters cancel. So we're left with 10 to the nine cubic millimeters. There are a billion cubic millimeters per cubic. Now the liter is also a metric unit. It's 10 to the something meters on each side where n is an integer and is therefore a cubic blah meter. Figure out what n and blah are. So one way to think about this is how big roughly is a two liter bottle of Coke? So think to yourself, is half of that gonna be 10 meters on a side? Is it one meter? Is it 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001? Think about it for a bit. Okay, it turns out that a liter is a cubic decimeter. 10 meters is way too big. A meter on each side is too big. About 10 centimeters, that sounds about right. It's definitely bigger than one centimeter and certainly bigger than a millimeter. So you can come up with that it's a cubic decimeter. All you have to remember is that a liter is also a metric unit and then you can probably figure this out on your own. Next part, how many kilograms are in a liter of water? The metric system was originally set up. So the kilogram based on, uh, on a liter, so some, some integer power of 10 kilograms is a liter of water. Figure out how many that is. So a hint would be, think about the two liter bottle of Coke again, if you were to refill that with water or fill up half of that with water, then is that roughly 2.2 pounds? Is it roughly 22 pounds? Is it 0.22 pounds? Well, a kilogram turns out to be one liter of water. How big is a gram of water? What do you think? This one you can just directly calculate using the information that we have before. So a gram is a thousandth of a kilogram, 10 to the minus three kilograms. And we know that the volume of one kilogram would be a liter. So volume of a gram must be 10 to the negative three liters or a cubic 
centimeter. So a gram of water takes up one cubic centimeter of space. Chapter two, motion in one dimension. After a particle moves along the x-axis from some initial point to a final point, then it's got a displacement, which is the change in its position. Final minus initial is delta. The average velocity would be its displacement over time. So the change in position divided by change in time. Speed is the magnitude of the velocity at any instant. So the average speed would be equal to the ratio of the total distance it traveled, not the displacement, to the total time it took to travel that distance. Instantaneous velocity, we don't use the deltas anymore. We take the limit as a, an interval of time goes to zero and it turns into a derivative. Instantaneous speed would be the magnitude of instantaneous velocity. Average acceleration, again defined in terms of deltas or changes in velocity per change in time. On the other hand, instantaneous acceleration defined as the second derivative of position with respect to time, second derivative of displacement with respect to time. The equations of kinematics are ones that you can work out uh, from this, uh, this set of formula here using a little bit of calculus. And these are valid as long as you have constant acceleration. So you can see from the, the first one, v final, equals v initial plus acceleration times time. Well, where did that come from? That came from our definition of acceleration as the derivative of velocity with respect to time. If the acceleration is a constant, you can just integrate both sides of that equation, get a times t is equal to the change in velocity. So bring that x, that uh, v initial over to the left side and you see it's a delta v is equal to a times t. Same thing happened for the rest of these, just integrate that one again and then the acceleration becomes acceleration term gets a half a t squared when you integrate that, that again. These are valid again as long as a is constant. If an object's falling freely in the presence of Earth's gravity, then it gets a free fall acceleration towards the center of the Earth. Now, if it's going to fall over large distances, we're going to have to use Newton's law of gravitation. But over short distances, we can say the acceleration is basically constant and about 9.8 meters per second squared. Here's a practice problem for the watch. You drop a five kilogram bowling ball off the Great Wall of China an eight meter height at some invading Mongolian. So you're defending the wall and you wanna know how fast this would be falling when it hits a Mongolian horse archer whose head is two meters off the ground. Now, uh, we also have to be concerned with how it's gonna take out these Mongolian frost giants who stand four meters tall, obviously. Now, how fast is the bowling ball when it hits a frost giant? Whenever you have a problem like this, that you, you're gonna need to solve more than once. So basically this is the same problem, but with different numbers, then it's really a lot faster to solve it using variables first. So this is gonna be a general theme of the course. We're gonna try and solve as many things as possible without substituting in numbers and only substitute in numbers at the end. This is, uh, this is useful because a lot of questions on the, on the exams are gonna just require you to leave it in variables and use computers to solve the problems to actually substitute in the numbers. It's also a great way to learn physics because once you get your equations from that, you can look around at the different terms in it and see does this terms, uh, where, where it is in the equation, does this change the answer how I think it should? And if not, maybe you've made a mistake somewhere. So let's substitute in here. We've got that the final velocity squared must be the initial velocity squared plus two a delta x using our constant acceleration kinematic equation. Kinematic equations are constant acceleration. So v final is root two g delta h. All right, so then let's look at this a bit. The final velocity depends on the gravity acceleration. If that gets higher then the final velocity gets higher, that makes sense. It also depends on the height difference. So if something's had farther to fall, it's had farther to accelerate and we increase the velocity accordingly. All right, so everything is uh, everything sort of scales the way we, we think it should. It's a bit harder to get a feel for why the velocity final should go like the square root of 2gh. Once we get into energy, we'll have a better understanding of why that should be true. Substituting in the numbers, we can see that the, the horse archer gets hit with an 11 meter per second bowling ball, while the frost giant gets hit with a 9 meter per second bowling ball. Hopefully that cuts it. Chapter three, vectors. So scalar quantities have only magnitude and no direction. Vector quantities have both a magnitude and direction, and as such, they obey the laws of vector addition. Two ways to think about adding vectors A and B, the triangle method where you put the tail of B at the tip of A, you just sort of translate B over there, and then you can say that the tail of A to the tip of B is the resultant, or the parallelogram rule where you 
align their tails and then the parallelogram that's made by A and B, the diagonal of that would be the resultant. This is, these are two valid ways to geometrically add vectors. You can also project vectors into their components. So if this is vector A and we know that it makes angle theta with the X axis, then the X component would be A sine, A uh, cos theta and the Y component a sine theta you can get from a little bit of trig. So cos is adjacent over hypotenuse and sine is opposite over hypotenuse. We'd use the i vector to represent a little bit of vector, the unit vector in the x direction. So i is equal to one in the x direction and zero in the y direction, while j would be one in the y direction and zero in the x direction. So unit vectors, what, what does the word unit mean? Unity uniform it means oneness so a unit vector is a one vector it means a vector that has a magnitude of one if you want to find the resultant of two or more vectors you can resolve them into their x and y components and then just add those components together in 2p04 we're also going to introduce some additional vector notations here that you're probably familiar with from algebra so uh, triangle bracket notation and by far the best in my opinion is column vector notation Column vector notation involves the least writing, and when you're adding vectors together or taking the dot product, it's very easy to see what combines with what across. So this is, uh, this is what I'll use most of the time. A linear combination of a set of vectors is any sum of multiples of them. So a linear combination is a, is a property of a set of vectors. Linearly independent is, again, a property of a set of vectors. So this doesn't apply to just one vector. It doesn't make sense to say, is this vector linearly independent? linearly independent from what you can say is a set of vectors linearly independent but not an individual vector so what it means is if no vector in the set is a linear combination of the others meaning you can't get any vector in the set by adding up multiples of the other vectors the cartesian basis vectors i j and k are the ones uh, this is just i and j that we were talking about before these are the unit vectors that you could use to easily write out vectors in rectangular components or Cartesian components. There's a few different ways to write these, which are i hat or maybe just i or x hat to say that it's the unit vector in the x direction. Now let's now let's add some vectors. So find out what this is. The sum of four angle 30, meaning magnitude four, making an angle of 30 degrees with the x-axis, added to magnitude three, angle of 60 degrees with the x-axis, and write the answer in Cartesian and polar form. And then try it again for this one, where we start off with one in rectangular or Cartesian form, column vector notation, and we're gonna add it to three angle 30 degrees. Again, in Cartesian and polar form. So these ones are in polar form to start with. Cartesian form is like this one. All right, so to do this, you can just say, all right, the angle tells me the angle from the x-axis, so I know that the x component is going to be the magnitude multiplied by the cos of that angle, y component is the magnitude multiplied by the sine of that angle. Carrying this out, you can come up with these two, these two components. So that's your answer in Cartesian form or rectangular form right there. If you want to find what it is in polar form, you know that the magnitude would be the root of the sum of the squares of these two, and the angle would be the arctan of the y component divided by the x component. You can work that out by drawing out the triangle if you like in radians 0.747 or 42.8 degrees, multiply by 180 degrees per pi. Similarly, for the other one, you should come up with 11.5 angle 23 degrees or 10.6 and 4.5 in Cartesian components. And that's it. Thank you for participating in lecture one. See you in lecture two.